to get started. It's 7.01. Um, the first thing I wanted to do tonight, uh, we, we often have quite a few people who join um, just to make quick announcements. We'll also do announcements again at the end of the meeting. Uh, but if you have community announcements, events, that kind of thing, um, we'll do those at the beginning of the meeting and then again at the end of the meeting, uh, just to make sure that everyone's captured. We have quite a few folks that join to make announcements and then want to jump off. So uh, if you have one of those updates and would like to give it right now, uh, we'll go ahead and get that taken care of. I'm thinking of you, Ken, and, and others if you have updates. Um, that way you don't have to stay with us the whole night if you don't want to. Um, okay, great. Well, I'll go I'll go first. Hi, I'm Ken from the Sorensen Community Campus on 9th in California. And I guess the biggest announcement we have oh, you is that we're going to be um, the, the biggest announcement is that we are going to be resuming recreation programming on the campus. So Salt Lake County's fitness center and the basketball gym and boxing gym will be opening on March 1st. So not next week, but the following week, Monday, March 1st, um, we'll be resuming recreation programming. Um, folk patrons will have to have um, an appointment or a reservation or reserved time slot. Um, but that's an exciting development for us. Um, we opened in the in the summer and then with the spike in november we went back to focusing on our essential services but now we'll be able to have recreation programming again um, we also have um, drop in drop off tax assistance available again by appointment only um, but that's being offered at the Swartzen campus and the donated dental clinic continues to be open and the youth programs continue to be operating um, we will be opening the pool, but not until the construction is complete in, in the pool. Hopefully that's going to be April or May, um, depending. That's my announcement. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Cody, do you just want to ask your question? Yeah, is that, are there any requirements for the tax services or is it available to like all residents of Glendale or Salt Lake City? Um, so it is income based. Um, I think it's fifty fifty three thousand dollars as is the. It's basically the IRS has has some uh, a threshold under which you can receive free tax assistance programs. This is one of those IRS supported tax assistance programs. Um, tax help. Uh, I'll put the the link um, in the chat to um, where you can get information as well as make an appointment for assistance. Cool. All right. Thanks. All right. Uh, any other just updates or announcements? All right. Uh, we'll move on, Lauren, uh, to Lauren, who's going to do a presentation on the nine line uh, RDA. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Turner, for allowing us to come tonight. I'm Lauren Parisi. I'm a project manager with the Redevelopment Agency of Salt Lake City. Um, and tonight, I wanted to touch base with you all on the RDA's nine line project area. Um, I do have some slides put together. Would that be helpful? Or would you prefer to kind of chat about it generally? Uh, go ahead. I, I just made it so that you can share your screen. Okay, awesome. Let me see. Okay. Can you all see that okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So just quickly as an as a reminder, here's a map of our nine line project area boundaries. Um, it runs along 9th South from I-15 to the east to I-215 to the west. And really I wanted to come to your group tonight because um, there's kind of two parts to establishing a project area, um, a re an RDA project area. And the first is to really create a plan. And we created our nine line plan back in 2018. 
Um, and that's when the RDA board or the city council adopted the plan. And then from there, um, the RDA has to negotiate with participating taxing entities um, that wish to commit a portion of their tax increment from new development to the RDA. So this is what has been going on um, for the past two years or so. Um, and it just wrapped up in December. Um, so ultimately the city, the school district and the county will be participating um, a portion of their tax increment to the nine line project area for 20 years. Um, and additionally with that, as a result of the negotiations, um, some of the initial budget numbers have changed from the plan to what's going to happen now. And so we have to amend the project area budget to reflect those updated numbers. And really the, the big things are that um, instead of the project area lasting for 20 years, or sorry, 25 years, it's going to be reduced to 20 years. And so the RDA will collect a little bit less because of that. Um, and then the county, um, they would like to see the RDA complete these sort of benchmark projects. And when and if we do, um, they'll increase their participation amount. So that's why the budget has to be amended. And you all might have received a flyer in the mail about that. Um, and that's, that's what that flyer was regarding. Um, but just to um, touch on those benchmark projects that the county would like to see us complete, it involves com uh, completing an anti-displacement strategy um, specific to the nine line, creating an accessory dwelling unit program that supports the construction of ADUs in the nine line, and then um, creating a sustainable development policy that um, holds new developments to higher sustainable development standards. Um, and so within the nine line project area, there are overarching objectives and more specific goals laid out. And these things all derive from the city's West Side Master Plan, which you all might be familiar with. So generally the RDA is really tasked with carrying out the projects that are outlined in the city's master plan. And so to start the objectives and the plan that we'll be focusing on are laid out here, but really it's the revitalization of vacant or underutilized lots in the nine line, increasing commercial vibrancy or the renovation of existing commercial spaces, specifically for locally owned businesses, um, promoting new housing opportunities, um, such as mixed income housing, workforce housing, and family housing with three or more bedrooms. And in terms of housing, it's really about creating more units and not um, taking away from existing units. So I wanted to reiterate that. Um, and then I think I skipped one, but employment vitality is really about supporting the creation of new jobs and businesses that provide living wages within the community. And then finally, public space and mobility and really supporting um, new public transit opportunities to facilitate people within the neighborhood and outside of the neighborhood. And these are the, just as a reminder, these are the nodes that I'm, I don't think I got to that. Oh, you know, I'm, I'm missing a slide, sorry about that. But so these are the kind of more overarching objectives and then we have some initial um, projects that we'd like to start with in the project area. And I'm missing this slide, I apologize. But really the first is to work on property acquisition. And we would be looking to acquire properties within these specific community, um, neighborhood and regional nodes that the nine line project area has laid out. Um, and then I don't have the slide here, but the other projects are involving um, the creation of an ADU program 
and then also the creation or completing that anti-displacement um, policy, and then focusing on regional trail enha enhancements. So enhancements to the Jordan River Trail and the Nine Line Trail. And then just as an example, I think you all might be familiar with this project, but um, the West End development is one of, is the first project that the RDA has given a loan to in the Nine Line Project area. So we gave them a $3.1 million loan, and this is for the renovation of existing warehouses um, on about 9th South and 7th West. And that project is underway with construction, and they anticipate um, the completion of the work in August, and the units, the commercial units would then be ready um, to, for a tenant to move in to utilize. And so here are just some pictures of the, the West End project, and um, they're just, uh, it's an adaptive reuse of the warehouse buildings. Um, so that's just an example of the type of projects that we do. Um, but that's really all I have for now. And I really wanted to give you an update that we're starting to collect tax increment in the project area. And um, we're focusing on these objectives that are laid out in the nine line project area plan. Lauren, um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you know whether there's anybody from within the area um, representing our neighborhood on the RAC, on the advisory committee? From on RAC? You know, I, I don't know who specifically, if they're from the Glendale neighborhood. Um, I can certainly look into that, um, but I know who's on it generally, but I don't know if they're from Glendale. Yeah, is, is the, are all of the positions filled right now? I believe they are, yeah. yeah. I think we were looking for one recently and it was filled, but I can definitely double check on that um, if you're, you or anyone in your group is interested. Thank you. I had a question about do you have any possible examples of tactics that would be possibly included in the anti-displacement strategies? Because yeah. I'm just like a rent. I, I live right down the street and I'm a renter and like, I love to see that development, but honestly, I'm like, ooh, that seems like my rent's gonna raise from that. Yeah, it's kind of the crux of redevelopment in terms of finding that balance with providing investment, but yet um, not driving people out and not trying to inflate prices and things like that. And so I think the, AD, the ADU program is something that we're really interested in terms of um, working on uh, preventing displacement. And if we can facilitate kind of loans or some type of funding, for additional dwellings on lots to uh, promote home ownership, but also allow people to have e extra income on their lots. That's something we're looking into. Um, and then generally we're always looking into doing affordable housing projects with deed restricted rent um, and things like that. And I think we, with the anti-displacement policy, I think our strategy is to actually hire an outside consultant that really has expertise in the types of tools that can be used um, to do that. So that's something that we hope to do right away to really understand how we can balance these, um, our goals of investing and, and making the community a great place as it is today, so. Does that help a little bit? Yeah, definitely. I'm, I've am i talked to Turner and Ashley about possibly holding like a community conversation about accessory dwelling units in Glendale because it seems like a really good tool to combat like the yeah. affordable 
crisis. So it'd be cool to possibly, yeah, that as a tool seems to make sense. Yeah. And we know that accessory dwelling units are actually quite costly to build with like connection to utilities or, and everything. So we hope to kind of help with those types of costs. Cool. All right, any other questions for Lauren? All right, well, thank you, Lauren, for your time. Um, as the project moves forward, if you would just check on the, the Community Advisory Committee and let us know so that uh, I can get that information to Jeremy. Um, yeah. I don't know if Jeremy shared his email or not, but if you wanna email me at the one I've been emailing you at, um, I can make sure I forward that out to everyone. Yeah, I'll definitely do that. And thanks for your time tonight. And if you guys have any questions or comments in the future, feel free to email me. Hey, Turner. Yeah. Um, last I checked, uh, there was nobody from District 2 on the rack on that board. Um, it can have between, I think, seven, I want to say seven to nine people, and five of them have to be city residents. Uh, but I, I, I think District 1 and District 2 weren't represented at this point. So if you have recommendations, uh, I think there's some vacancies. But if, uh, Laura, maybe Laura can double check and make sure it's the updated one. Thank you. That'd be great. Um, so moving on to the next agenda item, um, we're going to move on to our elected officials. Um, Andrew, we can start with you if you want to go first. All right. You mind if I share my screen, Turner, for a sec? Uh, yep, it should let you. Excellent. Uh, thanks, guys. I've written updates. Um, here we go. Sure that. Can you see that? Yep. Yeah, I can't see it. Um, I am going to swap up to here. Nope. Where is it? And now I can't even get to it. Let's see. There we go. All right. Can you see that? Yes. Sort of. All right. This is uh, from our work session this past week about parking. And it's multifamily parking. Uh, the city has been looking at some off street parking requirements for new developments in the city. Uh, we may not think this applies to our neighborhood very much, but it could if new development comes in. Um, our neighborhood is basically on the left hand side, general and neighborhood center. Uh, Neighborhood center is, uh, if you think about the neighborhood and our commercial development, so uh, the plaza by the circle, um, Van Turner's places, corner of 9th West uh, and 17 South, 13 South, that sort of stuff. Um, that's neighborhood center. And then general is everything else. So if infill comes in, they build new developments. Uh, think about the ones on 17 South and 10th West, the new uh, townhomes they're building there. Um, these are proposed for all these new developments. So for the general um, Glendale area for studio and one bedroom apartments, one space for a dwelling unit. And if it's a two bedroom or above, it's 1.2 spaces for a dwelling unit, right? Two, five spaces. So um, it gives you a sense of sort of shrinking the, the parking footprint for new developments in the city. Uh, and then for neighborhood centers, which are generally more of commercial mix and uh, really a hard place uh, to figure out how to do this well. Uh, one space, uh, space per dwelling unit. I'm not sure how much this would impact us that much in our neighborhood. I think most of our places that are zoned for this probably wouldn't have that for the most part, but um, keep an eye on this as we move forward. It'll have a lot of impact along the tracks lines and uh, downtown particularly. And we can talk more about uh, that going forward. Second piece, I'll show you a quick map actually scroll up to it. Um, this is the city. This is uh, Glendale Poplar Grove over here. The blue are is that neighborhood center context where we have more uh, commercial development. You see the plaza here, Vance Places, uh, 17 South lot here, California Avenue. 
Uh, and then all the gray is that general context for us. And we don't anticipate um, this changing much in the zoning. The zoning might change around these larger uh, sort of corners, but that's about it. Uh, so it gives you a sort of sense, but downtown, you see that red is transit context, very low parking minimums, um, in some places zero, depending on the size of the units. And then green is that urban center context, sort of midway between a tracks line and maybe residential. Um, and so we'll be discussing this over the next few weeks. Um, we'll also have a different discussion that sort of dovetailed about on-street parking requirements, which hasn't hit us very much, but uh, particularly around North Temple and those tracks lines, it's starting to hit a lot of neighbors a lot. We've got a lot of big developments coming in with uh, limited parking requirements in them. And so people are getting a little frustrated with the street parking situation. So uh, more to come on that. Second piece I may not have talked about before is the city apprenticeship program. This is uh, from the city website and they've got general jobs in here, but mixed in, they've got these apprenticeships, which are new this year. So engineering and civic engineering has an apprenticeship for part-time. Um, roadway engineering is an apprenticeship. Basically, these are ways to get your foot in the door in these jobs. If you don't have any experience in them, get some experience and it can catapult you into a career in that, in that sort of field. Uh, the city is doing this intentionally um, during COVID to help folks who have lost their jobs or looking to change careers kind of midlife particularly or earlier if you're early on as well. Uh, Trails and Natural Lands has got one. Uh, and there'll be a few more coming online as well as you go forward. So I recommend if you have folks who are looking for jobs or looking to change jobs and are interested in anything uh, within the city to take a look at this uh, the city website for jobs. And you'll see these coming up. I think that is all that I really wanted to share. Let's stop the share here. There we go. The other things that have uh, happened a lot recently at the city level, uh, we talked about the nine line RDA and uh, I, I do like the requirements in there. I know it's second and fourth of the county, but the requirements about anti-displacement and the ADUs can be very helpful. In the context of the ADUs, we had a discussion this week at the city council about inspecting new, um, buildings that aren't built on site. So some of the companies that are building these accessory dwelling units, the small ones in your backyard, the separate ones from your house, um, are modular or prefab buildings. So they're building, and one company's building them in Canada, a couple of them in other states. And the city code right now would require the city to inspect them as they're built on site for electrical, plumbing, et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of these are being built pre-made. And so when they get on site, they're already together. You can't break into the walls and check everything out. And so it's caused some problems with people being able to use those companies for these kind of buildings. Um, one that I've looked at recently, Modell, they um, could do a one bedroom all included for probably 140,000 and below. So if you have land, that's a big cost right there. And you can build a one bedroom house essentially for pretty cheap compared to anything else you're gonna get in the city. Um, and that's where these ADUs could really be beneficial. Um, plus, with an incentive from the city, we need to look at that um, to help get more housing. And then I would think on the anti displacement side, we talk a lot about existing residents um, and some preference or priority uh, to help them stay in the neighborhood, own their own um, home or some sort, or add on so they can have these units as well on their, on their property. Last thing, probably. Yeah, uh, two things. One is um, we discussed a new noticing requirement for companies that are doing work in the public right of way. Um, Google, Verizon for cell towers, uh, power companies, those kind of folks on, on, on poles. And it was supposed to be just above ground. We've had a lot of complaints from our residents about uh, Verizon with some poles they're putting in and then Google with all they're digging up uh, recently in our neighborhood, particularly of the street and not getting notice when it's coming on and having driveways blocked and other issues. And officially companies are supposed to notice when they're coming in, but the noticing is a pretty vague um, language in the ordinance. And my experience is I haven't gotten any notice at all when they've come down my street. Um, they just show up and they may put up a sign someplace and they may say that's noticing, but it's not really helpful. So we're discussing that uh, companies, the proposal right now is companies would need to notice um, the areas they're going to work in 
prior to getting their permit from the city. Uh, that might mean a little delay from when you get the notice to when they actually do the work, but it would ensure that they couldn't get their permit until they noticed everybody, um, which is really what we're trying to get to or get information out to folks so you know who to contact if there are concerns or issues, or just you know what's going on in your street. Um, I get a lot of questions about the, the dig up on the street for Google, uh, just because folks don't know what's going on. And then the subcontractors don't tell much, much to people. So um, that's happening. And we're still debating that ordinance change. And then the last thing is ranked choice voting, which came up this week in the city council meeting. Uh, this is something that's been around for a few years now. And uh, there are actually three bills in the state legislature um, currently about ranked cho choice voting. Essentially what it is, is um, depending on the way you in, in do it, for like a city council race, if there are eight people running for uh, a city council position, right now you'd have a primary election in say June, I think it's June every year, uh, every two, every four years. And then you, the top, top two vote getters go on to the primary election in November. So there's two elections basically. In ranked choice, everybody gets on the ballot for the final election and you just pick your one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, whatever order you like them in for that one. And then it sorts through the top uh, vote getter wins essentially. It, it could alleviate the, the need for a primary election, which would save some money, even if you had to spend a little more on ballots for the, for the, uh, the end one. And there's some belief that it could help with the general tenor of some elections as well, if it's not all or nothing, because can, theoretically somebody who got ranked, say uh, number two on a lot of ballots could get more votes than a few who get number one, a couple who sort of polarized um, that way. So we're debating that. It has a lot to do with the state and a lot to do with the county since the county runs our elections. Um, and so they're talking through, can they do it for this year, for this election coming up? Uh, what it would require? And we'll have some more discussions about that um, pretty quick. Probably it'll heat up after the session, the legislative session's over when we see which bills pass and what requirements they put on us. And then the city would have to tell the state if we're willing to do a pilot project this year or not. I think we have to notice them by April 15th or so. So uh, if you have strong feelings, let me know, but we'll talk some more about that. I think that's the big stuff. Uh, any questions for folks? All right. I don't have, sorry, Levi here. I don't have any questions specifically about uh, voting and ranking your vote, but around the parking situation I did, this is my first time joining one of these meetings, so I'm talking out of turn, just let me know. But I was curious about the parking situation by my house. I live near 1700 South and uh, the water park. Yep. And right there, so I've owned my home here for almost 13 years now. And within the last, well, since Operation Rio Grande, Things have been kind of getting out of control right here with the overnight parking. Uh, needles on the ground. I, I have children here. We've had three RVs within the last year catch up, on, uh, go up in flames. And we've had one dead body in a car five houses away from my house. Can we do anything about no overnight parking on 1700 South from like Redwood Road to 9th West? Mm -hmm. um the city's aware of that. The homeless situation, the city's aware of that and doing outreach to those um, vehicles generally. Um, the current ordinance is 48 hours, so you can notice somebody. I think you're, the, where you're going with it is to just take 17th and say, we don't, we don't have any overnight parking on 17th period, which would make some sense because to make a total ordinance change in the city means all the neighbors would have that. So if you parked your, your car on the street, you've yeah, been no. in, so. Just 1700 South, just because they did the same thing to 2100 South. As a matter of fact, before they all moved to 1700 South, they were on 2100 South. And then we now have all the trucks and the the, the homeless there. And, and I don't have anything against the homeless. My main concern is <laughs> they're not always passive and easy, right? So I, I've had issues where I'm walking with my children and I have young daughters and someone will be out there defecating uh, uh, right there on 1700 South in front of everyone and, and things like that. So anyway, so that's why I'm bringing that up. Yeah, I mean, you're right. We talked a lot about 2100 South when the same issues down there. I'll, I'll bring it up with uh, parking enforcement and see what we can do on 17th. Uh, you're okay. thinking from the river West, just that stretch uh, to the canal. That's yeah, that's it. Uh, right now there is like 
semi trucks there are like broken down cars parked there anyone on stripe you can see people cooking their meals at night and things like that and i know that the city has done a lot of outreach and i i commend them for doing that at times it's gotten better i've worked with a uh, someone else from the city his name i think is tim what's his name he's over this Cosgrove. area yes tim cosgrove i i called him many times and he would come and get the situation assessed but that, that's a big one that it's bringing crime to the area i've had my garage door broken into within the last couple of weeks i know all their neighbors have had the same problem and so i don't know what's going on there but. i'll reach out to tim and bring make sure he's on board and then uh, we'll bring oh. it up Marking and see what we can do. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Levi. And Levi, I wanted to mention that on Saturday, the community council is doing a conversation with the police chief. Um, and I, folks can find out information about that on our website, glendaleutah.org slash meetings. Uh, the Zoom link for these meetings and for those meetings uh, are all on that page. But I would love to have you come and bring this issue up. It's something that I've heard from repeatedly from folks on 17th and over by the uh, pump track on 9th South. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. At the water park situation, like just everything that's going on there, right? The drug problem. I see the security guards there, but we still see new graffiti coming up on the park and things like that. All that has to be handled. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks. I said Josh on here and um, I'll make sure Josh is in the loop as well in the mayor's office. And I think we'll move on to Josh now, uh, representing the mayor's office, if you want to give an update. Uh, yes, I would. Thank you. Um, so yeah, my name is Josh. I'm from the mayor's office. I'm a community liaison. And um, so just to address uh, Levi um, about the uh, issue that you brought up with 1700 South, I know that um, Tim has spoken with me about it. And I know he's spoken with people in the past about it. Maybe. Um, I don't know how long it was you, you know, spoken with him. Perhaps it was a time when I wasn't available or somehow you got over to him, but um, he's another community liaison like me. And so I'm mainly working with um, districts one and two um, for a lot of the issues that come up there. Um, and so, yeah, I'm aware of that one. I know that I've spoken, I've spoken with um, compliance, which includes parking enforcement on that as well as homeless outreach. And I know that they're looking into uh, coming up with new, strategies for dealing with RVs because they're very difficult. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult issue. Um, and, you know, it's another component of homelessness that uh, sometimes gets overlooked because, you know, obviously unsheltered homelessness is very important to address, but also we have a you know, contingent of people that live in uh, RVs and vehicles and that cause some issues sometimes as well. So, um, yeah, I will, um, I'll put my contact information in the chat and you can reach out to me as well and um, give me contact info at a later time. And But when I hear more, I can I can keep you updated um, about more uh, on strategies to deal with that. Um, so yeah, going to other uh, general updates, I'll just paste the bunch of links into the chat box there just for people to follow along. And uh, if you're, I guess people watching on Facebook wouldn't see that, but everyone on this call can. But um, uh, the mayor delivered her State of the City uh, speech last month, the end of last month. And uh, together with a plan for 2021 uh, policy plan and, and goals looking ahead for the year to come. And there's a lot within that, uh, within the speech and within, uh, within the 2021 plan. Um, and just in the interest of time, I'm not going to go over all of it right now. So you can follow that link on SLC, um, on the SLC mayor's uh, page uh, that links to a text and video of the speech, as well as uh, the 2021 plan, which you can view um, there as well. And um, uh, we're always happy to take feedback and questions on that. <clears throat> the uh, Racial Equity in Policing Commission, which was um, established earlier this year, is continuing to uh, do their work and uh, slcrepcommission.com is their website if you want to get involved in sharing your voice on that and uh, the um, session that they had last uh, month was a listening session uh, with the chief and with the city council and the mayor and that's available to view on that website 
uh, as well. And uh, you can submit, I think you can submit comments anonymously also. So anyone can um, give feedback on that if you wanna have your name known or not. Uh, we kind of alluded, I think earlier to the boards and commissions. And uh, so that is the responsibility for refilling the, the spots on boards and commissions in the cities within the mayor's office. And so um, that third link that I put there, slc.gov slash boards contains uh, that information about the different boards and commissions within the city. One of them that I was made aware of uh, was the housing, uh, sorry, board of appeals and examiners in building services. So housing, uh, the board resolves appeals pertaining to building construction, housing and abatement codes that may contain errors regarding judgment and purpose made by administrative and official. Uh, so it works a lot with building services and the building inspectors. And I believe that uh, vacancy is for district two. So following that link and clicking apply and indicating uh, what board uh, you'd like to serve on. Um, and that will be reviewed uh, within our office. And uh, moving on, the next one I shared was the 600-700 North uh, project and survey. I had that one in uh, from last week when I was talking with uh, Rose Park because it is directly in their neighborhood, but it does affect everyone on the west side also, that corridor 600-700 North. Um, and it's a very heavily trafficked area, especially that as that curves going into Redwood Road. So there has been a, a number of uh, three different uh, proposals for how uh, that uh, reconstruction, how that is gonna look. And uh, there's a survey available to take after you, if you click that link and you can view the different proposals, the different models, and then uh, answer and uh, give your opinion on that. And that's gonna be open for the next little while for residents to respond to. Also, uh, many of you that are following the city and things going on in the city probably follow already followed the SLC government Facebook page, but I uh, just wanted to highlight it because of the number of uh, panels and discussions that are held on their Facebook live events uh, that are held on there. There was one earlier this month on uh, unsheltered homelessness uh, with our homeless services director and um, with uh, Salt Lake County Health Department. And that one is very informative. And I think answers a lot of questions that people uh, usually have about unsheltered homelessness in the city. So I'd encourage you to take a look at that. Also, uh, there was a another open house from transportation about the 300, uh, 300 West reconstruction project. Um, and so, yeah, I, regularly there's a lot of information that's put out on there. So uh, take a look at that if you have not already. And uh, also with regard to homelessness, there was a page uh, that was recently put up uh, by the city, uh, a homeless services dashboard. And that contains, let me actually just share my screen real quick just to show you this. Uh, let's see. So I think you can see that now, my screen. So the homeless services dashboard will take you to this page. And uh, one of the things it features is the, an effort to show people how uh, the shelters are being utilized uh, night after night. And so it shows the percentage of beds um, at the homeless resource centers that were filled uh, from the previous night. And um, so it does contain uh, that information because that's often often a question. Uh, also a number of other uh, questions that commonly are asked about unsheltered homelessness and, and encampments and the role of the city, county and state in responding to that. It also contains a table about uh, comparing shelter space from, from this year to previous year. Um, and then uh, just show a map showing requests for, uh, for cleanup services submitted on SLC mobile app. So it's just a dashboard containing a lot of information with regard to homelessness. I think um, it's created to respond to a lot of questions and to provide transparency about how the city deals with, with homelessness. So. I would encourage you to take a look at that if you um, if you'd have the time. Uh, take a look at that. That's a good resource. And stopping my share there, I uh, that's all I had. And uh, happy to take any questions. Good 
Uh, it doesn't look like there's any. Thanks, Josh. Uh, Thanks. I'm going to post my, uh, I'm just going to put my contact info here in the chat right after. So you can move on. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, with that, we'll move on to Detective Oliver. I don't see any other elected officials on. Uh, it's the middle of the legislative session, so I imagine they're busy, but we'll move on to Detective Oliver. Thanks, Turner. Um, are there any questions, concerns? I usually want to like to start off with uh, with that. If there's something you're seeing in the neighborhood that needs to be addressed or, or any uh, other questions or concerns. Do we circulate the numbers for like drive-by shootings and things like that? Where do I get that information? I know within the last six months, we've had two on my streets. Yeah, you can get uh, just about all of the, the numbers on Salt Lake City PD website. If you go there, you can get, uh, uh, let me pull it up real quick. Exactly, or I can tell you exactly where it's found, but it's usually under um, community, let me see real quick. It's under, the numbers are usually gonna be under uh, uh, resources or open data. So uh, you can kind of search through that and see all the, the calls that have taken place in your area. In fact, one, one thing I kind of wanna highlight while we're there is, is it's called a crime re reports map. And if you click on that, you can actually put your address in and use some filters and it will tell you everything that's occurred around your address. Um, and you can, you can go as far as a year out, uh, six months out, whatever you wanna put in there. It's really, uh, it's, it's a pretty good tool that, that we've been using for quite a while. So I recommend that. And Levi, I also wanted to mention um, 1700 South for the no parking. Uh, I'm the, kind of the one that worked on the 2100 South area. And it was, an, it was a long process to get the city to red curb that. One of the issues we've run across with the red curb on 17th South is the, the tennis courts and how it would affect those that were playing the tennis. But that can be also fixed by do, using some of the, uh, the water park as, as some parking for them. Because I know that those tennis courts are probably the, I would say probably the best tennis courts in, in the city. And they're used pretty regularly. Uh, there's some tennis clubs that are, are pretty prominent over there. So that's one of the issues that was just just kind of a uh, concern, but uh, I fully recommend or agree with you on on the issues that are on 1700 South. So, yeah. so great questions. I don't um, think 1700 South Park has lights though. So folks shouldn't be there at night playing tennis. Okay, yeah, and that's I, true. So that's we, the, could, we could red curb it at night or, or try and do a, a, a time frame instead of just a straight red curb from mm -hmm. morning to night kind of thing. So that, that's a good idea. Uh, any questions, other questions, concerns? All right, um, I'm gonna pull up just some numbers here from January, since we just got our January uh, reports for, for District 2. Um, our violent crimes have, have gone up a little bit. Uh, aggravated assaults mainly has gone up four since, since last year as compared to last year. In January, so that's a little bit of concern. The biggest increase we've seen, though, is in larcenies and motor vehicle. So that's car prowls. Basically, car prowls have gone up by about 40 since um, over last year, which is a concern. And I think that's about a hundred. Let me make sure here. Uh, about 84, 51 percent. So that's a little bit of concerning. Is the car prowls. Um, also with that, motor vehicle thefts has also gone up by 84.6% as compared to last year. So that's a huge concern. Um, motor vehicle thefts, and I, I'm seriously a broken record when it comes to this, I'd say a high majority of our motor vehicle thefts are from people that are warming their cars up in the winter um, in their front, in their front uh, driveway. Um, I've told people before, if they want to get on a on a scanner app in the morning, you'll see and be, be kind of shocked at how many cars are stolen in the morning while they're out uh, warming up. So I um, highly recommend not starting your car. Plus um, it is also, there is a, a ordinance against uh, running your vehicle. So <laughs> just be careful with that. Um, another thing I wanted just to mention, um, in, in our stats for January, the highest majority 
uh, let's see, let me scroll down here. The highest majority of our drugs that were taken off the street in, in district two were, was marijuana. And that was $71,000 worth of marijuana was seized um, in district two. There were 20,000, over $20,000 worth of cocaine, $29,000 worth of heroin, 2000, over $2,000 of hallucinogens and $21,000 worth of, met, of amphetamines. So in just in district two, there's $145,682 worth of drugs taken off the streets in, in uh, January. So um, that's, that's always a plus when we, we can see numbers that high. Uh, the bad thing is those are just what are seized. So we don't know what wasn't seized and what is still, uh, still out there. Um, any questions on those numbers? So with the marijuana from Prop 2 a few years back, they said you're allowed to carry a certain amount of grams without a card or whatever. Is that, so is a seizure of marijuana massive marijuana operations or is that just like normal people with like a few grams on them? No, no, it's, it's going to be, well, all of the above. Um, but it's, if the mer medical marijuana thing is, is uh, as, far, as far as I understand it is it's got to be um, in not in a leaf form mm. correct me if I'm wrong in that one but uh, uh, as far as I know if it's if it's in a leaf form then it can it could possibly be seized um, so that's the whole gamut from personal use all the way up to distribution are we also like prosecuting people that with marijuana possessions as well as the other drugs that I do not know about the prosecution side of it um, that's something that we'll have we have to bring up or talk to the city prosecutor on so that's kind of above us so that'd be a good question for them to see if the prosecution of marijuana compares to meth or or something else all right thanks uh -huh. and ashley did you notice any differences since last meeting in your neighborhood just curious um i know there was like a huge bust of that house <laughs> <laughs> um you know what happened uh, with that i'm hoping that you saw a little bit of a difference uh in there and, mm -hmm. and especially uh, around the Jordan River Parkway. We've yeah, been... Jeremy would be a better person to ask. He's on the parkway a little more. I ha I mean, it does seem quieter for sure okay. around the house. Okay. It does. Um, so, yeah, go ahead, Jeremy. It, it does seem quieter <laughs> okay. now that I think about it. Okay, well, good. <laughs> that's good <laughs> if, if you, um, that's always a plus. Do you have um, any one... details about it? What's that? You have like the details about it? I don't have the details as far as the raid, but I know we put a lot more resources into that area. So that's the positive. And I can pull up some resources and I can get it to you either um, before next meeting or at next meeting. Yeah, definitely. Sure. Uh, one of the things we did notice, in, and this is because of the, the people that were kayaking along the river is they, they did find a body um, near the Peace Gardens. So uh, I was able to go out on the river last year uh, and that is a remarkable, I never realized one how cool that river was until I got down on the the water and, and went through there. But we appreciate anybody that's that's uh, on that river giving us any information as, as, what, as far as what they see from the river side too, because that just doesn't get mentioned as much as as the trail side. So uh, that's one of the things that were found that was found in the last month. Really, that's uh, the numbers that I have for this month. Are there any other questions, or did that bring up any other concerns or anything that needed to be? talked about i had a question about like the drugs and i guess i was curious to know how those charges came along i guess is there like a lot of uh you know pulling over vehicles or is it a lot of i guess uh pedestrians or is it kind of going out on house calls do you have any breakdown of that I don't have the breakdown as far as what's picked up as far as on traffic stops or what's picked up through our narcotics officers. Um, but I, that's the whole, that's from, from just a normal ped stop to all the way to a, a drug bus that's um, with the SWAT team. So that's, that's the whole gamut of, of what's, what's uh, taken. I just don't have a breakdown as like 50% this 50% that. All right. Thank you. But yeah, and that's just district two, just, just so you, you understand that's, that's not the whole city. That's just district two. For sure. 
Oh, and I just wanted to mention Turner that uh, again about the meeting on or the, yeah, I guess it's a meeting, Zoom meeting on Saturday with the chief. So um, if anybody can make that, it'll be a good one. And we, um, to build on what Detective Oliver said, we plan to do quarterly longer conversations on a specific topic. So we figured we'd start this Saturday with a conversation with the police chief, but we plan quarterly to do one hour conversations on crime. So we, if there's specific issues, specific areas, things like that, uh, we'll be scheduling with Detective Oliver to see if he can't participate in some of those longer conversations. Um, but if you have ideas or suggestions for topics, we would love to have them. Um, and then we can get them scheduled out. And Turner, I think um, the gang sergeant wanted to do, come and meet uh, and kind of come to one of these meetings. So I think next month I'm going to invite him to a Glendale meeting and he can maybe touch on those drive-bys and the gang activity on the west side. So okay. if you're good with that, I'll invite him and I'll just take a short time and turn it over to him. So if there's any questions for him. That would be great. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Awesome. Oliver, I just wanted to say uh, thank you guys for your service. Uh, I've been in Glendale for a while. I've had interactions with your police officers and every interaction has been a positive one. So thank you for your service. Thank you, Levi. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, all right, we'll go ahead and move on. Uh, the next item on the agenda, um, Sarah let me know that she has to drop off. So what I'm going to hurry and do, um, I, I wanted to let everyone know to save the date for May 29th. We're going to be doing, um, we had planned last year to do a, a neighbor's festival, just a community fe festival to celebrate the neighborhood. We were unable to do that because of COVID. This year on May 29th, we'll be doing it again. We're calling it Glendale Neighbors Festival. And what we're planning to do is instead of doing a festival where everyone comes together all at the same time, we're gonna do a little bit of a distributed festival. So we're gonna do throughout the neighborhood, a festival with different stops, uh, kind of like a scavenger hunt. So we'll have different community partners, different organizations, all participating in different ways. We'll have additional information uh, as we get further into the planning. But one of the ideas that uh, we'll be incorporating into it is an idea that Sarah had to do a Glendale on Parade uh, festival or component to the festival. So Sarah, if you'd just like to talk about that really quickly. Yeah, you can see me. Hey, everybody. Um, yeah, so the idea was just to, since we're still kind of, uh, you know, on pseudo COVID lockdown, trying to keep people's spirits up and um, do something fun that focuses on the, the personality of our neighborhood. Um, the idea was not completely unique. I was, uh, I saw pictures of Mardi, what they did for Mardi Gras in um, New Orleans. And because they couldn't have the parade, people decorated their houses as if they were floats. Um, I loved the idea and I thought that would be something fun that we could do um, that would just enliven the neighborhood. Um, uh, Turner suggested that we do a month of this so we could let people know um, that they could de decorate their houses during the month of May. And then that would be leading up to the neighborhood, um, the May 29th. Um, oh, the theme, um, there was just a Glendale community survey that Turner did or the group did. Um, and I was just looking over that today and by far the word that people used the most was diversity. So if we, we can maybe, maybe make that the theme of um, house decorating, I, I'm not sure what that's gonna look like, but maybe people can interpret it as they like. Um, we would have people sign up so that they show up on a map so that anybody wanting to check out all the decorations can see who is participating. Um, Turner, I think you mentioned getting some kind of gift card and doing a raffle uh, so that anybody who's participating would be entered into the raffle and they could win something. Um, and, you know, in terms of 
any help that I might need. I mean, I could do most, most of it on my own, but um, whether or not we want to do this, things like having a logo for Glendale on Parade, or maybe there's just a logo for the neighborhood festival. Um, it, we either get a volunteer or pay someone a small fee to do that. Um, putting together a flyer that we distribute so that we're not just doing social media, um, but we're actually delivering uh, information about this endeavor um, to everybody in Glendale. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, that's, that's the gist. Anybody have any questions about that? It's pretty simple. I just want to add on to what Sarah said. We're, we're looking for volunteers actively to help with this. So if you're interested in getting involved and in volunteering with the community council, this is one way that you can do so is by getting involved with planning for this event. Um, and you can contact me, uh, Sarah, really anyone, and we'll, we'll make sure we get you involved as we get uh, moving forward with the planning. Uh, Thanks for squeezing me in, Turner. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, with that, I'm going to move on to the next agenda item. Um, and before we get too far into anything, um, I know when I share things on my screen that they are generally teeny tiny because I have a big monitor. Um, but I'm hoping that folks can see this. I just wanted to remind folks of kind of the structure of the community council. So we elect five officers, a chair, two vice chairs, a secretary, and a treasurer. And then in addition, we have some at-large board members. Uh, and then underneath or kind of working with the board are different committees. And so the committees provide an opportunity for folks to engage um, in, a, in a little bit of a different way. So there's opportunities to be involved in any of our different committees. Um, our Keep Glendale Beautiful Committee is focused on cleaning up the neighborhood um, and, and just general beautification. Welcoming Glendale is focused on making the neighborhood more welcoming to especially refugees and immigrants. Um, we'll, we'll be talking about the, the Homelessness and Housing Stability Committee tonight. Uh, Buy Nothing Glendale, the committee there will be helping with administer our new Buy Nothing Glendale group. Uh, which you can find through our Facebook page. And then the Dark Sky Glendale Committee, we'll be talking about that at a later meeting. Um, but if you're looking for ways to get involved, we have opportunities to be board members, to be involved in committees, and then to help plan the Glendale Neighbors Festival. So I just wanted to provide this as a little bit of information just on the structure of the Community Council, but we're actively looking for volunteers um, if you're interested in getting involved, there's plenty of opportunities to do so. Uh, with that, Cody, I will let you talk about your uh, proposal for uh, the, the housing or the homelessness and housing committee. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name's Cody. I'm treasurer on the community council and uh, I, am, I am a housing case manager for chronically homeless but i've actually taken a new position so um i have a lot a lot of experience in the homeless community and just with the new operation rio grande pushing a lot of these issues into our neighborhood um it seemed to be a good car or a good time to have community conversation and try to see what you know us as residents could do to help the situation. Um, and so we wanted to start a homeless services committee uh, to kind of bring in different resources, the VOA that do outreach for the city and then the road home who provides shelter services and just kind of have a community conversation, uh, get some solutions and see what people, what we could do to help, you know, solve this problem in our community. So we'll be having the first um, meeting on Jan or Tuesday, March 9th. And so I'll put my information into the chat and you can email me if you're interested. 
but yeah, I would definitely recommend just Levi since you uh, voiced some concern. It'd be good to give your participation in this and sure. anyone who's interested. Thanks, Cody. Uh, any questions for Cody or comments? All right. Well, thanks, Cody. Um, March 9th, what time did you say? You're muted. I didn't. I didn't, I didn't say 6 p.m. totally. Okay. And we'll make sure we get that out. Um, with the minutes and, and other information so that everyone has that. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, with that, we have reached the end of our formal agenda with agenda items. I wanted to give an opportunity if there's issues or questions or ideas for future uh, agenda items, I'd love to hear those. Uh, and then if there are any additional announcements or things that came out um, just through the conversation, We'll kind of turn the time back over to the community if you have questions, comments, uh, anything like that. All right, uh, doesn't look like it. Um, one final reminder, we have our one Glendale survey out right now. Uh, if you haven't taken the survey and you would like to, uh, let me get you the link. Um, we, we're really trying to get a good cross section of our neighborhood to complete this survey. We're using it as the basis for the one Glendale plan that we've been working on for the past year. Uh, and it's going to be an opportunity to, to provide feedback on everything from transportation to parks here in the neighborhood, uh, sustainability. There's all kinds of different things that we're looking for your feedback on. Uh, the, the, language, uh, the survey is available in English and in Spanish. So if folks are more comfortable completing it in Spanish, please feel free to do so. Um, we're looking for really everyone in the neighborhood. So if you haven't had a chance or you haven't completed the survey yet, please do so. We're hoping by the first week of March to start drafting the One Glendale plan. And then at our April meeting, we'll be presenting it in detail and taking questions and comments um, and, and moving it toward finalization, hopefully at the May or the June meeting. Um, but please, if you would, go complete the One Glendale survey. Um, and then the only other uh, announcement that I wanted to make is the first Thursday of every month, we're having the Keep Glendale Beautiful committee meetings. Um, they are being held via Zoom at uh, five o'clock. And the, I have, that, oh, sorry, <laughs> go ahead. We're that information up. is available uh, at glendaleutah.org slash meetings. All of our meeting information is always posted at that link. Um, what were you gonna say? Oh, sorry, I'm Michelle, I'm Levi's wife. Um, so with the five options for the Glendale Water Park, are those the only five options available? No, they're not. We actually created those out of thin air just as a way of providing an opportunity for people to weigh in on actual proposals and just to kind of get people thinking. Um, we just did that as, yeah, just a way of generating some ideas and getting people engaged we'll be working with the city to start refining what the actual proposals look like based on cost and a bunch of different things. Um, that process, the city is hiring a consultant, I think in the next month or so, and then they'll do a whole community engagement process. So in a lot of ways that process is just starting. Okay, so from what I understand, it cannot be a developed structure. What does that mean? We don't know, um, and that's one of the things. So we'll be doing in March, we've invited folks from uh, Parks, Natural Lands, and the, I can't remember the whole acronym, but the folks that are over parks uh, to come and have one of our community conversations on Raging Waters. And the thing we've asked them to bring is information on what would actually be allowed as a development there. Uh, because we're unclear and there's not a lot of certainty um, maybe Council Member Johnston has more information, but it's somewhat unclear as to what could actually be there. 
Uh, it's got to remain park or open space. So probably depending on the, the city definition of a park, you can build stuff in a park, but it can't be probably residential, um, probably limited commercial, depending on how you frame it, those kind of things. But you just can't turn it into like a residential or a office park or anything like that. It's got to be a, a park. Why not? Uh, it's on the deed restriction by the state when it was built in the 70s. Um, the, the land had to remain a park in perpetuity, I believe. For for how long? Forever? Yeah, as far as I'm aware, it is forever. It was, uh, I think it was only state funding. Um, but yeah, it was part of the deed restriction when they built it back in the late 70s to 1980. Okay. Um, and then I did have a, a question. I reached out to... Um, Turner, you, yeah, about the lighting on the 1700 South Park. And I got an email back from a Austin Kimball, who said that it's likely that the Parks Division will make funding requests um, to fund additional lighting there in the future. How can I follow up on this? Like when would funding be made available and how can I continue to push this issue? Um, I'm gonna put my email in the chat real quick. Um, this is something we plan on talking to the Parks Department about. There may be a way for the Community Council to help request that funding. It may come directly from the Parks Department, um, but let's connect and talk about that. And that should be one of the first questions we ask when we do the community conversation with the Parks Department in March is to really ask what that timeline looks like, how the council can get involved. Um, yeah, so let's connect that way and then we'll we'll keep on top of this because it's okay. something that is a priority. Um, it's been brought up by many, many neighbors down in that area. Uh, and there are some opportunities, I think, for the community council to maybe raise some funds and help match some. So we should talk about that with the Parks Department. Perfect, thank you. Uh, any other questions? One other thing I just want to mention, um, Diane actually emailed me about a month ago, maybe two months ago, about all the cars that we've seen on the Nine Line Trail and on, um, I'm not actually sure if it's the Nine Line, it's the Jordan River Parkway uh, on the west side of the river um, by the, the International Peace Gardens. There's just been a lot of traffic on there. And it looks like one of the uh, poles or rocks or something that was there that prohibited cars from getting on there was removed. And we've been in contact with the Parks Department and it looks like they'll be resolving that shortly. So they said they're gonna look at getting the pole put back in and potentially put in some rocks or some other features to make sure that those cars are blocked. But they've been there uh, I've noticed them during the day and at night, and we were concerned that somebody would get hit or that there would be an accident of some kind. And that's just something uh, that I wanted to follow up on and let you all know that we've been working on. Uh, and the Parks Department have, have indicated that they're going to address it. Thank you for that. Uh, any other questions or comments, issues too? We'd love to hear them. All right. Well, I don't see any. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and if it's all right with everyone, we'll go ahead and move to adjourn the meeting. Um, our next meeting will be March. Let me get it pulled up so I tell you the right. Oh, March 17th, one month from today. Uh, and again, all of our community council meeting links to the Zoom meeting uh, for those that are watching on Facebook that want to watch, to participate on Zoom. All of our meetings are available at glendaleutah.org slash meetings dot HTML. Um, and that's where all of our meetings are always posted. You can add them to your calendar directly from there and you can join directly through those links. So uh, we would love to have you participate in any of our committee meetings, in our community council meetings, and we're looking for volunteers. So if you're interested in getting involved, please reach out uh, and we'd love to connect with you. Thank you all for your time tonight. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Have a good night, guys.